Hello, this is Eric. Today we're going to be talking about a very fundamental topic to all kinds of communications and software, the actual underpinnings of the internet. What I mean is networking. Now, what are we going to cover? What is the internet? How does your home network work? What is the OSI model for network communications. We're going to go over examples of using networking tools for both analyzing and troubleshooting a network and network performance. I'm going to explain what a VPN is for, roughly how it works, and then we're going to get into some uh, examples, demonstrations using a network troubleshooting tool called Wireshark. So this is a pretty action-packed, uh, challenging lesson. I'll make no, no bones about it. But there are some interesting tools here to use, especially uh, Wireshark, that will help you in your understanding of how the Internet works. So I encourage you all to get a, a copy of Wireshark from the web. Um, it's, it's a free tool. It's fantastic. Uh, there's other good network analysis tools built into your operating systems that you can use and there's other tools that you can download and use as well. So I hope you enjoy this introduction to networking. What is the Internet? Before the Internet there were networks but the networks were not connected. They called them autonomous systems. Then they started to get connected. To do that, you needed to connect these private networks over some other infrastructure to other private networks. That infrastructure is what we know as the Internet. It has a bunch of services. There's obviously a whole lot of hardware. The services enable things like finding other networks. So when you have a domain name, i.e. www.google.com, how do computer systems know how to find google.com? Well, they need an address book that maps website names to the IP addresses used by the elements of the network, the routers, smart switches, things like that. That system is called the domain name system. It's huge, it's global, it's very fast. Let you find anything on the network and you just get connected to it just by using its name. Now, that's one, just one of the services provided uh, by the infrastructure we call the Internet. Now to get into this Internet, and I'll just say, and the, the other major part of that is the actual traffic pipes, fiber optic cables, undersea cables, satellites, all these things that facilitate the communications of the data and make up the Internet. Now when one network traffic wants to get on the internet we've got a little challenge there see when I built my network I didn't know about your network and I might have used the same IP addresses as you in fact I probably did I mean everybody on a home network has addresses in the address space of 192.168.1.x and the X is some number from basically 0 to 255 and that identifies what's on your network but we all know everybody's using the same ones so how do those connect without conflicting how do I connect to the right one at that address well that's another uh, system another service really provided by your own network when it wants to connect to the internet it's called network address translation 
with network address translation, your private address is translated to a public address. Then it's able to go find who you're trying to connect to. It finds its public address on this other network. And that network's network address, network address translation software will transform that public address to a private address that works on their network. So this resolves all the duplication and ambiguity of addresses. It also allows putting in some nice controls because you don't just open up your whole network. You only open up parts of your network, like your business's web server, for example. So that's a key service. Uh, I'll now be explaining how that service works in your home. And kind of use the home model as a model for explaining also how, how businesses work and how their networks loosely connect to the internet. So we're going to use a very common one here. Um, this is the Verizon Fios network. You see the internet cloud there and you also see the public switch telephone network cloud. So the internet is so you can communicate with it and it can communicate with you and the uh, telephone network cloud is so that your home if you're using a, a phone over Fios can connect to other phones across that network. Now the Fios gateway that is the Verizon equipment and it connects over fiber optic to this box here optical network terminator this is on the back of your house or your apartment somewhere in that box it converts the fiber to regular Ethernet cables so it's a physical layer conversion and it also provides you with um, television so it connects to a set-top box so it splits up the data on the fiber into these two different kinds of signals. Now we're going to ignore the set-top box part. Um, I'll just say yes it does have an IP address on your network. There are ways to connect to it and ways Verizon can connect to it and you know do things to the box. Um, but we're going to focus on this part down here, your home network. So you have a some type of Wi-Fi router in your home, most likely. That's connected to something that gets you to the internet. In my case, it's to this ONT. Now this router has a bunch of services in it, including network address translation. It also has a firewall for protecting your network. And um, it establishes the uh, IP addresses used by the devices on your network so that there's no conflicts with them. So everything gets its unique address and all the traffic goes where it's supposed to go. Now here we show a uh, like a laptop or desktop connected over an Ethernet wired connection plugged directly into the router. You can do that um, I, uh, I don't do that directly. I plug in a switch. So right in the middle here I have a switch connected and then I have a few things hanging off the switch that I want to have the most reliable high-speed communications. It, you know, not any Wi-Fi interference. So I will plug in um, like a, uh, a Roku on the switch. So it's directly connected to my router. Then all the laptops and phones and whatever other wireless device you might have, maybe a printer, those would be connected over Wi-Fi to the system. But they all effectively work the same way. Now this whole network, the whole home network here, this is a called a microcosm of the larger network. A business would have big router, connection to the internet, but then many, many computers connected off of it. 
hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands. They would have to have much more significant infrastructure uh, to enable all of that to work. They would also have to maybe partition up, add some uh, address spaces so that there were enough unique addresses on their network to handle all of this equipment. So let's talk a little more about these addresses and how I can go from my home computer out to the internet. Internally on the network, I have a private address and there's numeric ranges that are designated as private. 192.168 is the prefix for a private range. Another one is 10.0, private ranges. When I go out through my router, however, I need to get a public address. The reason for that is the outside world doesn't know anything about my inside network. It doesn't know my address. It can only send data back to my router, and my router figures out where that data is supposed to go. So the router, it knows when I talk to Google, that Google is going to talk back to me. And if a different device on the network is talking to a different website, it keeps those traffics aligned. Um, and I'll explain how it does that. So the router gives me a public address, but I only have one. And that's pretty typical for a home. You'd have one public address, but I have lots of devices. Even if I just have two, I have a conflict. So I need something else. That extra thing I need, in addition to the address, is the port number. So ports are like channels on TV. You've got one TV, but lots of channels. Here I have one router, but lots of channels of data that go through it. I have, in fact, 65,500 and 35 ports available. But the first 1,024 thereabouts, those are reserved for special internet services so that you can always know how to communicate to them on their channel. The other ones, they're just kind of assigned random. So I connect to Google, it goes through my router, and I get a public address, and my traffic is on a specific port. So when the data comes back from Google, um, the port number is in there so that my router knows who to send the data back to. That's how it keeps track of what website I'm talking to. Now, I realize this is uh, a little complicated without seeing some of this in action. So I'm going to start showing you some of this in action. The first thing, what about these IP addresses? So there's a website, whatismyipaddress.com. It tells me what my actual address is. I have, shows two different types here. IPv4 is the older type. IPv6 is the new one. The reason we needed this one, this version, is because the internet was just getting too big. Too many systems, too many mobile phones, too many IoT devices. So IPv6 has a huge address space. I think it's something like more stars than there are in the universe. Something crazy. This one is pretty small, um, relatively. But we ran out. So we have a new, new version. So some of my systems... Some websites are using IPv6, some are using 4, so we, we keep these two addresses. Now, this address is usually the same, but it's not guaranteed to be the same. But that, that typically doesn't affect what you're doing um, in, on your home network. So you can look up your own address right now. Uh, just go to this address and you'll see it. Now, that address is the 
outside public address of your router. Because again, it won't see your internal network. All right, so now you've seen how your home network works, how that kind of applies to how the internet is connected and all put together at large. Now we'll talk a little bit about how data is communicated on the network. There's a model of networking communications called the OSI model. It's been around since the, gosh, 1978. Um, it is a conceptual framework. It is not an explicit model of exactly how everything works, but it's very helpful. So when you have two systems that want to talk to each other, you have, like, say, at the basically up here at the application level, you have like an end user, and he's sending some data to somebody else. It goes down the stack through all these layers across physical connections or they could be wireless and then up the stack to the other end user and the application that they're using so that could be an email or an instant message now what are these different layers in this stack in this architecture well, we're going to start at the top, just like the data does. Um, this could be a web browser. That's a, that's the simplest enough example. But there's some other services, applications that run it at this layer. It could be for file transfer. Um, but a web browser is a good one that everyone's familiar with. Then we go to the presentation layer. This is not about giving a presentation or showing data. This is about passing the data around key service typically provided here is encryption and decryption um, this is where you'll see some application level protocols enforced so there'll be HTML data here or XML data or JSON data then the session the session is uh, what enables the two systems to talk to each other it's like you call somebody on the phone. You have initiated a session with them. And so this takes care of the housekeeping associated with that session. So you know when you can talk and when they talk and you pass data back and forth nicely. Then we get into the transport layer. This is where those port numbers come in that I was talking about previously. There's some important internet protocols that operate at this layer. Transport Control Pro Protocol. That's the main one, TCP IP. It's kind of a kind of a twofer because the TCP is at the transport layer and the IP is at the network layer. But there's some other transport protocols. Uh, UDP is another protocol. Now, the network layer, this is where the IP addresses come in and all the IP related protocols operate down here. This is where routers typically function. Routers know IP addresses and they have maps that allow them to move the data around in the network that they know, right? So they know how to forward data around within their network. And there's a little, there's some extra stuff to be explained there as well. Because the IP address at some point also has to be translated down to something else. That's where we get into this next layer, the data link layer. Switches operate down here, the dumb switches. There are smart switches that work at layer three, but we're just going to talk about a dumb switch that basically just lets you take one connection in and have five connections out so you can hook up multiple multiple devices now at the switch 
at layer two, some extra things happen. Error correction is one of them. Uh, and some more address translation activities. So we know we had a, a port and an IP address at one point, and now we get down to this data link layer. There's another address. It's called a MAC address. So we have the media access control layer. So on your network, you have IP addresses, but those still are not used directly for moving the data from one entity to another. That's where the MAC address comes in. So that IP address is turned into the MAC address. The MAC address is unique. It's on your devices. It's on your network cards. It's on your phone. Um, it's c composed of two things. One is a manufacturer's ID and the other is your address for your device. And finally at the bottom we've got the physical layer. These are the wires or could be wireless. This could be fiber optic cables. It's what the data actually goes across to get from one point to another. Now you'll see lots of pictures of the OSI model, lots of explanations. They're all based on this document that you're looking at. This is the current source document from the International Standards Organization. So this goes into exceptional detail. If you want to know more about the layers, it talks about the different modes. Connection mode, that would be TCP. Connectionless, that's UDP. They have uh, different purposes for having different types of connection modes. So here's the detailed description of the all, all seven layers, everything about them, services they provide, functions, and so on and so on. I just gave you a very high level uh, overview of that. But if you want to get into more details, this is what you need, this document, ISO 7498-1. This stuff doesn't really change, um, at least not any, in any big ways, not, not rapidly, because that affects the entire Internet. All right, so we're going to move on to some networking tools. Hopefully, uh, make this a little more real. Show you some of the more interesting tools that people use on the network uh, when they are doing IT network work, uh, when they're doing some type of troubleshooting. Uh, you may be installing a new system and need to test out that system. So we'll get some clean screen here. So uh, first of all, I'm running two different terminal windows here. And um, they are different. One is running in Windows. This is running in the Windows subsystem for Linux. Uh, it's a virtual machine built into Windows, I believe, uh, probably running a version of Ubuntu. And this lets me run some additional networking commands easily that are not built into Windows. But it also lets me um, intercommunicate. Let's see if we can split these out. So we could see the communication basically from one computer to another, even though one is just a, a virtual machine. But it will help illustrate some of the, the points that I want to get across. All right. So say, for example, I am having trouble uh, connecting to a computer on my network, and I want to test what's going on. I want to see if I have basic 
connectivity. It doesn't mean my services or applications are running right, but I just want to taste for, check for a really low level basic connectivity. There's a couple of ways I can do that. And it also can tell me um, the health of the network connection. And um, the gamers out there will already know about this command, or they'll at least understand it if they don't know the exact command, because it also tells you connection latency, which is what I meant when I said health. If your connection is nice and fast, it's healthy. If you have no connection or a slow connection, it's unhealthy. We can see that with latency. So let's check it out. Ping is the command. And then you give it an address. You can either give it an IP address or you can give it a domain. So now we're talking to Google. Really, we are. It's pretty fast. You can see the, the times there. 6 milliseconds, 10, 15. It, it jumps around a little bit. That jumpiness in the ping, that's a, a term known as jitter. Um, but ping is kind of low priority traffic, so you'd expect it to jump around. If you have too much jitter, though, in general with your traffic, it may interfere with video and audio communications. Because the well, the, you can literally see or hear um, small variations in the time it takes for the data to uh, move around, be reassembled. So there's some other things Ping tells us. We see we sent six packets, six were received, none were lost. We can see some average times here. Does some statistical calculations. So the second number is average, just under 10 milliseconds with some deviation. This is the kind of a measure of jitter. Now I told you I could also do this with um, numeric addresses. That address is Google's DNS server. They provide the service on the internet for anybody to use. A little slower numbers there. Not much. The average time is pretty close. Now what else can I ping? Well, I need to know some more IP addresses. So I'm over in my regular Windows system here and now I see its IP address. I see some other things here which I'll help try to tie back to the prior discussion. So that's my address. Um, you can see I have some some version 6 addresses as well. I have a gateway. This is the internal address of my router. Okay. So when I go out to the internet, all my traffic goes through that and then gets transformed by network address translation and sent off to the internet. Now we see some other things here. Um, so this is my Wi-Fi. Bluetooth, it's disconnected. I don't use it. Now here's something different though. I see V Ethernet, WSL. This is a virtual Ethernet adapter and this is what's providing IP address to my Windows subsystem for Linux. So let's take a look at the similar command. on the Linux side. So we can see once again here's my IP address. This is just a local host, local loopback stuff. Not using that really. For traffic going in and out um, it would be this address now, can these two talk to each other? Let's see if we can ping. So now I know the IP address now, the internal system. It's 
see what happens. Okay, they can talk to each other very fast, less than one millisecond, which makes sense. It's all on the same system. Now, can this one talk to my computer? Make sure, yep, 159. Oh, here we go. Something's not working. Why is that? I have a firewall on the Windows side. And the firewall um, is simply not responding, allowing pings. So ping can be used to flood systems with too much data, uh, causing a denial of service attack. But there may be another way to prove that I have connectivity. So we're going to try another command. We're going to see if I have a route from the Linux subsystem to the host operating system. And I do. Look at that. And you can see it goes through the dot one address that we saw over here. And then to the actual uh, IP address of my system. So the dot one is basically it's the gateway for the Windows subsystem for Linux. The same way I have a, a different gateway um, out to the internet. I've got like a gateway in between these two local systems. Okay, so you've seen the news. <laughs> you've seen uh, traceroute. You've seen ping. Let's run another command. I'm going to scan my network. It's going to scan the whole address space and tell me what's on it. It's done. What did I find? So it basically did a, a check to look for responses from every single IP address in order. And it found some. And this, here's one. Found my printer. Found a Roku. doesn't know what some of these other ones are, but it did find them. This is a, I think that might be, yeah, I don't know. Oh, 102. This should be the uh, Verizon set-top box. Not much is up and responding right now. Um, you see different things different times. I saw my MacBook earlier on it. Sometimes you'll see a, a phone. You can see if other people are using your network. You find some devices you don't recognize. So Nmap is a good tool for scanning a network. Oh, and you won't find Nmap in Windows, though, um, without doing some separate installation. That's what's running it from Linux. Now, something else you hear about a lot in networking is a VPN. I'll just cover briefly what that's all about. So, basically, just about all the traffic on the Internet is already encrypted. But just because the traffic is encrypted doesn't really give you as much privacy as you might want. The, the elements of the network still need to know how to route the traffic. So they know where it's coming from and they know where it's going to. That in itself um, you know, can violate your privacy if you care about it, right? But it could say, hey, look, you're connecting to you know, such and such banks' systems. Oh, okay. Or you're connecting to... Um, you know, the PlayStation gaming network. You know, you can start to learn things about people and what they do on the internet without actually reading their traffic. So a VPN hides that. It adds an extra layer of encryption. So you still need IP addresses, but the IP addresses now are from you just to your VPN. 
inside this extra layer of encryption is the actual communication packets that are now A, double encrypted, but B, you've encrypted where the traffic's going, and only the VPN can decrypt that. So now people can't see where your traffic is going or where it came from because that's all hid by the VPN. Now the VPN then becomes the effectively your public IP address. This can be a little confusing sometimes. If you're on a VPN and um, it for from your company and your company's office is you know 500 miles away and you want the weather, location-based services are going to look at your IP address and give you the weather for your corporate headquarters office 500 miles away. Or it may, you know, give you, you know, movie theater locations that are 500 miles away. Whatever's using that IP address is going to get confused when you're using the VPN. So, anonymization of where your traffic is going to and from is one feature. The extra layer of encryption is another. Uh, and you can also use the VPN just for accessing your corporate office as opposed to just accessing the internet in general. When you go into your, your corporate office network, you would be coming in from the internet but through the VPN and you would hit a VPN server through its public address in your corporate network and because it knows how to decrypt the traffic it will enable you to then communicate with the systems inside your corporate network um, it will basically pass that traffic on um, through the router to the uh, correct endpoints okay now I promised at the beginning that this crazy looking tool here, the screen full of data, is going to make more sense. So let's check it out. First of all, this is a tool called Wireshark. It's fantastic. Um, it can analyze and dissect all kinds of internet protocols. It can even analyze and dissect protocols that aren't even on the regular internet. You can write your own dissectors and analyze custom protocols on private networks. It's vital for troubleshooting. Um, it's vital for just for general understanding, learning how things work. But I've troubleshot equipment before that was malfunctioning. Uh, I've troubleshot equipment that was misconfigured. And this was on, you know, major telecommunications networks. Wireshark is a very important tool. So we had uh, an OSI model. Let's go back take a quick look at the, the stack. And we can correlate this to Wireshark. So right now I am looking at a specific frame some specific chunk of data that Wireshark has captured. This is in the HTTP protocol, the protocol of web browsers. So we'll do it like this. Okay. So at the very bottom of how Wireshark gets the data, it first gets it physically. So this first chunk of data up here this is all the physical information. We've got a bunch of a bunch of bytes that have been captured. And we've got some information. A lot of timing information as you can see here. How much data? The number. You need you need numbering so that you can reassemble data that could come in in the wrong order. So it's uh, some good information there at the physical layer. And this next set, I'll close that one up. This 
is the data link layer. Now I've mentioned before at the data link layer that we have something called a MAC address. Didn't say what it looked like, but a MAC address is six hexadecimal numbers. So here's a source address. And notice there's two formats of it here. They say Intel. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means these they've, they've separated out these first three, which are the manufacturer, which in this case is Intel. This is called a, uh, oh, it's an MOI, member organization. Eh, I can't remember exactly. But it tells you the company who made the equipment. So I'll, I'll, you know, somebody's sending me data, the source is from, um, from an Intel device. Where's it going? It's going to this MAC address. So the data at the data link layer is moved around using the MAC address. Now, the network layer is where we use IP addresses. So we have a source. So in this case, it came from me, and it went to that destination, because this is my internal IP address. That's a public IP address on the internet. Now, there's all kinds of information here. I'm not going to go into it, just going to kind of look at the key, the key things sent a chunk of data oh, I will I got I do got to back up one second and show you these addresses here they show up right 7a 15 6a 93 that's the MAC address that's in the raw data and this is this is the other um, MAC address. It's right there in the raw data. And then these encoded bytes. These are that's an IP address. So if I look at this hexadecimal number twenty three, right here. Well. 2 times 16 is 32, 32 plus 3 is 35, 35. So all this information is in here. So there's MAC addresses, there's IP addresses. That's happening at the, the network layer. Now we're up to layer 4, transport layer. This is where we see these ports. And again, the ports are in the information. 443, that is a, a secure HTTP port. And since my network address translator in my router gave me that port number to use to send out the data. So when a response comes back, it's going to get routed back. It's going to have that port information so that even though the public IP address would look the same, it's going to get translated through it to my IP address, specifically to that port number, um, so that the communications are correct. Now we're going to look at a slightly different one that has some actual HTTP data in it. And we could read some of this. If you look, you'll notice this is the actual format of the HTTP protocol. You could type this into a tool called Telnet and actually initiate HTTP commands manually if you were so inclined. And then we've got data. We can't read what it is. This was a, uh, I believe this was an HTTP, yeah, it's a connection keep alive. So it's just a way of a website to check with me and say, hey, are you still there? And it keeps the connection active through the firewall so that they can connect to you. That's how you get uh, 
annoying ads that keep showing up over and over again on a web page even though you're not doing anything active. All right, so what I want to do now, we've gone through basically the mapping here. I'm going to take a quick look at some live capture. So this is a capture I did earlier today. Now I've got several web pages open in a different window. Um, nothing else really running. But just watch what happens when I initiate a capture. So we are just flooded with information. This is happening all the time. Eh, pretty much everybody's computer. All kinds of protocols flying around. Some broadcast protocols, some communications with different websites. Um, there's a ping, ICMP. So now we're going to stop this. There's some protocols I don't even know. I don't know what this is. So this is a good one. This is a address resolution protocol. Um, this would be my gateway, my, my router, saying, where's this, who's got this device? I can't find this uh, device on my network. Tell the gateway so it can you know, move the traffic around. This is some secure data. So this is going to be all encrypted. It's on port 443, which is the HTTPS port. So that's one of those reserved service ports. Let's see if we can find a TLS. Oh, here's a ping. Just a small packet of data. A little eight byte ping. Here's some DNS. I'm trying to find certain mynetworksettings.com. I think that was the. Uh, actually, I don't know what that is. <laughs> A lot of secure packets here. Now, here's something interesting. So, when you first are setting up secure communications, um, you go through various steps. You say hello. Then uh, the server will say hello. And you'll negotiate on which encryption protocols to use. So, encryption was higher level. So, here we see transport layer security, right? So, it's above the TCP, which is here, right, internet, transport, so up at the session layer now. So this is at session layer in the OSI model. We won't be able to read any of this because it's going to be encrypted. However, some of this stuff you probably could at least look up, right? This isn't necessarily encrypted. What um, security encryption protocols to use. So systems have to know how to talk to each other with the right type of encryption. More DNS queries. So there's stuff going on all the time even when you don't realize these things are happening um, in your computer. Now Wireshark, of course, can, you can filter this stuff out um, so you're not overwhelmed with, with this junk. Like I can pick, say I just want to look at security. Now I'm just looking at the security protocol information. This up here is the filter. I've now gone to a website and run a capture. Um, the website I knew didn't use security, 
so we could actually read all the data. So here we see the initial request to go into a directory. We get an acknowledgement at the protocol level and then an HTTP protocol response of OK. Then I try to get deeper into the directory structure and make a new request. You can see all the, the low-level data down here. You can see the, the website I'm at and the URL string, information about the web browser that's in use, types of data that can be exchanged, tons of information. I get the OK back, and then I say, no, and then there's another low-level acknowledgement, and I say, let's get this image. All right, so now it's sending back all the data for this image. So let's follow, actually, let's see if I can follow this. So here's all the information. Again, we see a lot of human readable data here. Not a lot of binary stuff. What is that, that binary? This should be the data that I requested. Um, that is the, that's the image data. You can see right at the top here, content type image JPEG. This is the image header, some human readable stuff, and then all the image data. So you could, through some manipulations, actually copy all this data out and drop it in some other program and turn it back into the original image. That's what your browser does, so you could do it. You could do it manually. All right, I know, I know this networking topic is complicated. There are some very interesting tools out there, though, to play with, like Wireshark. Uh, this is the image, by the way. Archaic uh, AMD software. So what did we talk about? Well, what we were just talking about was using Wireshark for network troubleshooting. Fantastic tool. You should give it a try. It's a free tool. I went over the basics of a VPN, did some examples of networking tools that people use for troubleshooting networks. We discussed the OSI model for networks, networking communications between applications on networks and across networks. We use the your home network uh, general diagram of that to explain all the, the pieces and parts and how they work together and how that also applies to other networks like a, a business corporate network. And we talked about what the internet was. How it's just this big big connection of autonomous systems and then some of the key services that it provides uh, to enable those communications. So I hope that this was useful for you. Um, I definitely suggest you try out some of these commands on your own. Go to ping and trace routes and end map and IF config, IP config, yeah, it all depends on whether you're on Linux or Windows what some of the exact commands are, but they're well worth uh, checking out and learning more about how, how the network works so that you'll be better prepared for a future as a programmer or somebody in cybersecurity or just somebody, somebody working in IT having to troubleshoot things. All, all of those fields need this information about networking. That's all for now. Bye-bye.